Hey everyone, in this lesson I'm going to talk to you guys about macro autophagy um, and more specifically I'm going to talk to you guys about what macro autophagy is, what are the steps involved in macro autophagy, why um, macro autophagy is important and I'll also talk about um, some of the regulation of macro autophagy and some drugs that we use to actually activate or inhibit macro autophagy. So to begin, what is autophagy? Well, autophagy, if you break it down, auto uh, means self and phagy means eating. So it's a process of self-eating. And now autophagy is um, one of two major protein degradation systems in um, pretty much all forms of life, fungi, plant, and animals. Um, the other system being uh, the proteasomal degradation pathway. Now, there are actually three types of autophagy in mammalian cells. The first one is the one I'm going to talk to you guys about in this video, macro autophagy, and that is simply the bulk degradation um, of different cellular components via autophagosomes. The other types of autophagy in mammalian cells uh, include micro autophagy and chaperone mediated autophagy, and I'll talk to you guys about those types of autophagy in another video. Nevertheless, all types of autophagy have one thing in common, and that is the degradation of substrates within the lysosome, whether those substrates be proteins, lipid droplets, or organelles. Now, because it is a process of degradation, um, autophagy is responsible for cellular waste clearance. So that means it recycles nutrient subunits such as amino acids. And because of this, it is critically important um, in homeostasis. And another related process known as autophagic cell death can occur as well through autophagy. And because of all these things, because of it's involved in homeostasis and because it's involved in a process known as autophagic cell death, it is a critical, um, critical process during disease. So it's critically important to know about autophagy and what it's doing. So this uh, topic of this video is macrotophagy and I want to just specify to you guys that macroautophagy is an umbrella term for various different types of autophagy that all utilize autophagosomes and, and are degraded uh, through bulk degradation in the lysosome. And different types of macroautophagy are named according to what they actually degrade. Now, one type of macroautophagy is mitophagy or the bulk degradation of um, mitochondria. Another type of macrotophagy is reticulophagy or the degradation of uh, the endoplasmic reticulum in the lysosome. Another one is nucleophagy, uh, the degradation of nucleus in the lysosome. Um, and you can see all these are related to organelle degradation. Another type of macrotophagy is lipophagy or the degradation of lipid droplets. And another um, type of macrotophagy is actually called xenophagy, which is the degradation of uh, foreign microorganisms such as bacteria. And this is actually not all the different types of macrotophagy. There are many different types of macrotophagy. I just want you guys to know that this is an umbrella term for many different processes. And each process, each type of macrotophagy is named by the type of substrate that it's targeting. But even though they're all degrading different types of substrates, they all use a similar process, and this is what I'll show you here. Uh, so all types of macroautophagy begin at the endoplasmic reticulum, and it starts by um, the formation of something called an omegasome, or uh, a pre-autophagosome, a budding of membrane off of the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And this... Uh, pre-autophagosome, it's a, it's a developing cup-shaped membrane and it, um, is re it requires a complex, a protein complex with proteins uh, OLC1 or unc 51 like kinase, um, ATG13. ATG just stands for autophagy-related um, gene or autophagy protein. So ATG13, it requires FIP200 and ATG101. Now, you don't need to know all these proteins. I just... For now, I just want you guys to know um, that OLC1 is important um, for initiating processes of um, pre-autophagosome formation and 
um, initiating steps of macrotophagy. So the next step that occurs as this preautophagosome is becoming larger and uh, um, becoming more elongated, uh, there's another protein complex that gets involved, and this protein complex involves vacular protein sorting 34, or VPS 34, VPS 15, and Becklin 1 proteins. Now, uh, OK1 actually activates Becklin 1 through phosphorylation, and this complex with VPS 34, VPS 15, and Becklin 1 all act like a class 3 PI3 kinase, and they actually produce uh, PIP3 from PIP2. So phosphoinositol triphosphate um, from phosphoinositol diphosphate. Now this increasing concentration of PIP3 actually uh, leads to the recruitment of these things we call WIPI proteins or WIPI proteins to the preautophagosomal membrane. Now once those WIPI proteins have been recruited, other proteins are recruited as well. Um, some of these proteins include P62, which is a ubiquitin cargo binding protein. Um, MBR1 is a related protein that acts similarly to P62, and these act as um, somewhat partial selective um, receptors for different substrates in the cell. Now, another protein that's very important in um, this process as the preautophagosome um, elongates and matures and becomes larger is something called LC3-1. So another protein complex that's important in this process as well is um, the protein complex that consists of ATG5, ATG16, and ATG12. And this complex actually helps to target particular substrates and particular proteins to the developing um, autophagosome. Now, LC3-1 is crucially important in all this process. Now, LC3-1 actually comes from um, LC3, or pro-LC3, they call it. And pro-LC3 is, pro is actually cleaved by a cysteine protease ATG4 into LC3-1. So once LC3-1 has been targeted to the autophagosomal membrane, it actually gets activated by ATG7 and bound to ATG3, and then actually conjugated to PE, or phosphoethanolamine. Um, to actually form LC3-2. So um, as this conversion from LC3-1 to LC3-2 occurs, the autophagosome actually continues to elongate and then actually becomes a full-fledged uh, autophagosomal vesicle. This is when we call um, it a mature autophagosome. And then once you have an, a mature autophagosome with its contents, it'll actually fuse to the lysosome via snare proteins and Rab7. Once it fuses to the lysosome, it becomes an autolysosome. And then what happens is the membranes fuse together, the autophagosome releases its contents into the lysosome, and then those um, substrates are actually degraded in the acidic lysosome by particular proteases such as cathepsin B and L. There's other cathepsins as well. Now, because this is a very complicated process, there are um, there have been methods to actually categorize each part of this process. The first process is typically referred to as initiation. The second process, whereby where we're having formation of PIP3, um, this is what we call nucleation. Another process, as the um, autophagosome actually becomes larger through LC3-1 um, conjugation processes. This is what we call elongation. Then once the uh, actual autophagosomal vesicle actually forms and closes, this is what we call maturation. And then the final step is fusion. So this is kind of how we categorize each of these processes or steps in macroautophagy. So because this process is very important. There are many different types of regulation of the pathway. One of them is through AMPK or AMP um, activated protein kinase, which activates OLK1. Another one is through mTOR, um, which I've shown you guys in the previous video that it actually inhibits OLK1. There's also a protein known as BCL2 that can bind to Becklin to inhibit Becklin as well. And at the lysosomal interface, there are particular proteins. One of them is 
uh, VATPase or vacular ATPase. And this is actually the, the hydrogen ion pump for the lysosome. And this is where some regulation can occur as well. Now, when there are amino acids within the lysosome, VATPase can actually relay this information to regulator and then on to RAG uh, proteins. And this uh, machinery is actually called Linus machinery or um, the lysosome nutrient sensing machinery. So once the RAG proteins have, have been relayed the information that there are many amino acids in the lysosome, mTOR complex 1 can come and bind to these RAG proteins. Now another protein that actually binds to RAG proteins is TFEB or transcription factor EB, the master regulator of lysosomal biogenesis. So when these two are bound to the RAG proteins, mTOR can actually phosphorylate and inhibit TFEB. So mTOR can actually inhibit autophagy by a few mechanisms. One of them is through phosphorylation of OK1, and another uh, way that mTOR can inhibit autophagy is through phosphorylation of TFEB. Now there are actually some pharmaceuticals that can actually act to inhibit or activate macroautophagy, and a couple of them have been suggested to act on VATPase, such as chloroquine and bifilomycin A1. As well, there is also um, autophagy activators, such as TORN1 and rapamycin, that are actually inhibitors of mTOR C1, which would mean that mTOR would lose its ability to inhibit autophagy, which would essentially activate autophagy. Now, if TVB is not phosphorylated, it is free to move into the nucleus and bind to what we call the clear sequence. Now, the clear sequence is involved in the genetic upregulation or expression of many different proteins involved in the autophagy pathway, and some of these are necessary for lysosomal biogenesis, and others are involved in the pathway itself, such as OK1, BEC11, P62, and LC3. They're all targets of TVB transcription. So when TVB is allowed to be activated, it can actually upregulate all of these. So it can upregulate all um, or many different parts of the macrotophagy pathway. Now there's another related transcription factor, what we, which is what we call um, ZAC-scan or ZK scan 3, which actually is the opposite of TVB. It actually inhibits um, the transcription of these, um, these proteins and, um, and processes. So take a deep breath, guys. That was a lot of information. But what's the summary? What's the main point I want you guys to know from this video? Well, um, the main point is that macrotophagy um, is inhibited by growth and proliferation. We know that because mTOR inhibits macrotophagy. It's inhibited by energy because energy actually activates mTOR, which would then lead to an inhibition of macrotophagy. mTOR itself actually inhibits macrotophagy, but macrotophagy is upregulated by starvation and cellular stress. And when macrotophagy is upregulated, what does it do? Well, it actually recycles nutrients, so it's important in homeostasis. It's involved in proteostasis, so it removes some of that cellular waste. It removes old proteins or misfolded proteins, so it's important in homeostasis again. Again, it's important for organelle homeostasis to clean up a lot of those damaged organelles, such as uh, dysfunctional mitochondria. It's involved in infection control. We know that because macrotophagy is important for xenophagy. And it can also um, lead to a process known as autophagic cell death. So what are all these things telling us is that macrotophagy occurs um, at a consistent rate, but it can be upregulated by starvation and cellular stress to actually regain some energy, regain some nutrients that can be used um, during, during fasting states. Right. And because of all these processes, we see why macrotophagy is important in health and disease. Anyways, guys, that was a very long video on macrotophagy. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.